Welcome back to the Law and Crime Network. I'm Heather Hansen here with our guest for a little bit this afternoon, Mark Iglarsh. Welcome, Mark. I'm so happy to have you here as a guest today. Same here. Thanks, Heather. Appreciate it. I wanted to talk with Mark. We're going to be getting to the Tex McIver case and everything that happened this morning and everything that we anticipate for this afternoon with regard to more prosecution rebuttal witnesses. But before we do, I wanted to talk to Mark a little bit about a case that he's currently handling that has been in the news quite a bit, and that's his representation of Gabrielle Vega. Gabrielle Vega is a woman who has been on the news of late because she says that she went on a tour-guided group tour in Morocco. And during that tour, she was sexually assaulted. And what I found so very interesting about this case was when she posted her experience on Facebook, more and more women came forward. And then yet again, when Mark and she did some publicity and were on uh, Megyn Kelly's show, even more women came forward. And so it's really very reminiscent of what we've seen with the Me Too movement across the board. And it's so great to have Mark here to talk a little bit about that experience. Mark, how how do you think that it is that this has sort of snowballed into a huge number of women? And exactly how many women have come to you with stories similar to Gabrielle's? When we appeared on Megyn Kelly's Today Show uh, last Wednesday, we knew of nine victims. My client actually had the, the courage to post about her experience, thinking that that she just wanted to have others avoid the experience that she went through. And then eight women came forward saying, me too. So we went on Megyn Kelly and there was nine uh, victims that we knew about. Within two days, we had about 30 to 40 and today over 50. And as I was waiting for you to throw the show to me, I'm literally getting more. So this guy was the Bill Cosby, Dr. Larry Nader, Harvey Weinstein of tour operators. Yeah, it, it's an unbelievable story. So why don't you sort of take us through the story? Gabrielle was, a, a, she was take, going to school abroad, right? That's where it started. And then she went on a tour from there. Is that correct? That's correct. So she's from South Florida and uh, from here. Um, and she went to uh, take a gap year in uh, Spain. And she was 19 years old at the time. And like most college girls, she wanted to go see neighboring countries like Morocco, Portugal. So they don't go on their own. It's a little dangerous, ironically. You want to avoid any danger. So you hire a excursion company like this one, Discover Excursions. And they have like hundreds of people that go out each tour, primarily young college-aged women. And the tour guide slash one of the owners of the company uh, drugged her, raped her, beat her and sodomized her on one of the trips. It took her years, literally three years before she had the courage to post on Facebook about her account. She then had eight people immediately say, within a day and a half, me too. And now we're just getting emails and texts from women around the country, including a mother whose daughter fell from a 10-story balcony and it was of the perpetrators she was heavily intoxicated and she died. So that's a murder investigation that's taking place there. And again, you guys probably are too concerned about the lawyers. I'm not. Manuel Blanco Vela. Manuel Blanco Vela. That's the serial rapist, the serial predator who has been harming these girls, and we will not rest until he's in a jail cell. So, Mark, what, what are next steps? I mean, I know from law school and, and, you know, a little bit of experience that you've got jurisdictional issues you're trying to figure out as between, you know, you've got some, some of this stuff happening in Florida or originating in Florida, and then you've got Spain, you've got Portugal, you've got Morocco. Are you dealing with authorities in all of those places? And what do you think is going to happen next? First answer is yes. We're dealing with everybody from the State Department to law enforcement agencies all over. And candidly, I'm not an expert. I haven't had a scenario like this ever. So I'm reaching out to those who can help. We have attorneys in Spain that we're going to be speaking to that can hopefully put us in the right direction. Our first focus was simply getting on television. And there were some networks who said, we will not mention the guy's name. We won't put pictures of them on there. They're just too afraid. And I am so proud of NBC, particularly um, with how quickly they were able to get us on and immediately let the world know. From that, we had the link to the Today Show. That went 
everywhere. I put that out to my 50,000 closest friends and it went out and all these women were putting it out there. Within a day, Discover Excursions, the company, by the way, who sent me an apology, the, the, the lamest, most watered down, I'm sorry for it, is all they wrote. Um, they immediately pulled down all their social media and then the next day they claimed that tours were canceled because of bad weather. Of course, we posted what the weather was like in these cities. It was 63 degrees and sunny, so we knew something was up. And then the very next day, which was Saturday, they were permanently closed. And we rejoiced, we celebrated. That was our focus. Now it's let's take all this and go to authorities. And have you been working with the authorities? I guess in Morocco is where the authorities that you would start, right? Well, for that one single event that occurred to Gabriela Vega, but we've got, my goodness, we've got 50 accounts all over Spain, Portugal, Morocco. So it, it is a jurisdictional nightmare, but we are committed to getting someone over there who cares that there is a predator amongst them who will not stop. Um, I mean, there's only 50 we know about. Right. Um, imagine how many girls are harmed. I have to be able to find someone over there who's going to take this to the next level and ensure that he rots in a cage somewhere. Mark, the 50 that you've heard from, are they all Americans? I wonder if there's other women internationally who have had a similar experience. There are. We have one girl from London, another one from Switzerland, but I'd say 98 percent are American. And have they built a community? It's amazing to me, before you got involved and were able to get Gabrielle on NBC and on the Megan and Megan Kelly show, um, it's amazing to me that just Gabrielle's post on Facebook came up with nine names. You know, as much as we often speak negatively about social media, the ability to contact people, inform people, and put people like this together, especially people who are survivors of this type of thing, always amazing amazes me. Have, they, have these women sort of built a community? Are they supporting each other as they go on to each new step of this process? They are. It's been wonderful for my client who feels extraordinary guilt for not speaking out sooner, although she did the best she could at her level of awareness. She was broken. She was going to take her own life. That's how low this got for her. So she couldn't think about going public and letting everyone know. She didn't tell her own parents for over two years. So when she finally came out, there's mixed feelings. There's like, my goodness, look at all the support. Look how many other women are there to support me. But oh my God, if I had just spoken up sooner, how many victims there might not have been. So to your point about social media, you can say what you want about it. We took a thriving company and in two days, we shut it the hell down. Yeah. How many victims did we prevent? you know, moving forward. It's really extraordinary. Well, and it's got to be so empowering for these women. And that's one of the things that I've seen from the Me Too movement as as women discuss these things and as they come together and share their experiences, they they get strength off of each other and they begin to build a community and build strength together. And, and I hope that that's what's happening for Gabrielle and the others. Did you anticipate I know that you've said that, you know, money is not the first priority for any of these women. And that's, of course, commendable. But do you anticipate being able able to file any sort of civil suits or are you focused solely right now on finding the perpetrator and working with the police on trying to get an arrest and a conviction? Well, I can appreciate a lot of people who are going to be very skeptical of what flows from my lips in just a few seconds. I assure you this is the truth. We didn't think at all about suing anyone civilly. None of the victims, not one single victim brought up suing anyone civilly. Our purpose was to raise awareness and stop future victims. We're still now focused on trying to get him arrested. If there are people to sue civilly, I guess that's something we can explore, but that really has not been our focus at all. And if it really was, we would have reached out to the company when they were profitable and thriving and said, give us a big chunk of cash, which they would have done, and we would have gone away. We, you don't destroy a company that you're seeking money from. That's what we did. Yeah, it's it's amazing. It's sort of the in, the opposite of what we've seen in the past and understandable in the past with non-disclosure agreements where people have a situation like this and, and they go to the company and they sign some sort of a settlement agreement and everything is quiet. Instead, you and Gabrielle and the other women have sort of raised the awareness of this and done sort of brought, brought a whole lot more people out. And I'm sure, I'm sure that you're going to continue to hear more and more stories like 
like this as you become more and more out there and people become more aware of this situation. I really wish you and Gabrielle the best of luck with all of that, Mark, and I hope that you'll come on and continue to keep, keep us updated as for your, your, your seeking justice. I appreciate your compassion and your interest, Heather. Thank you. Mark, I wanted to I want to sort of shift gears with you now and get to this case that I know you've been on here at the Long Crime Network and you've talked to Jesse about this case, this case against Tex McIver, because it has had some interesting ups and downs just in the last week. You know, last week we saw that some of the counts against Tex McIver were dropped. Uh, two of the three witness tampering counts have been dropped because the judge didn't feel that they were appropriate to go forward. What do you think about that? And what do you think about the third count that is still going to go forward? Forward. I love it when I'm in trial and the state overcharges and or just doesn't have enough evidence to prove certain counts because you can only say so much, but jurors are reading in between the lines. I will say something like, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, if you recall on such and such a date, we began this trial and there were seven counts for your consideration. Now there's only five. Those other two went away. You don't even have to consider them. Now, jurors can read into that, and it's not favorable for the prosecution. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's really an interesting thing, and it's an interesting thing. I think that the prosecution, I agree with you, really overcharged at the very beginning. And now they're sort of caught flat-footed and, and don't really know what they're going to do next. Now, the one charge with regard to witness tampering that does remain is the charge for tampering with Danny Joe, who was really the key witness, I think, the woman who was in the car with Tex McIver and Diane during the events at issue. What do you think is going to happen with that charge, Mark? Oh, I, I, you know, if I knew, you know, here's my thing regarding that. Okay. So if you're going to kill someone, right, and this goes back to Jesse and I were talking about how we, you guys cover that case where the, I don't know, the big pole or something came in and then stuck into the woman's chest, I think it was, right, or head, or, and, and, then, and then he said, it, and he was convicted, and he argued that it was just a freak accident, and that didn't work. But, but the point in that case was either – he committed murder in the most bizarre way possible, right. or this was a freak accident. Same with this. What a ridiculous way to off your wife if you're really intending on doing it by including another witness who's there in your car. I mean, anything is possible, but it's more conducive, the defense would argue, to him being, I mean, one would argue negligent, but one would also argue being cautious because there's people out there that he's in fear of, and the gun just went off. If he really wanted to kill her, he would have done it without any witnesses, is the argument. From the defense. Yeah, it's uh, and, and I agree with you. It, it certainly is a very bizarre way to pursue the death of your wife. There's so many other ways you could imagine it being done. But I do, if I'm the defense, I think that I am concerned about a couple of things. I'm concerned about the lesser included charges. So I'm, I'm concerned about the involuntary manslaughter by criminal negligence, which is a misdemeanor charge, and the involuntary manslaughter by recklessness, which is a felony charge. What do you think of those two charges, Mark? Do you think that either one of those, the state has met their burden, and do you think that they're appropriate? Okay. Well, the analysis is very simple. First, they have to decide whether they buy his story that he had the gun out because he was concerned reasonably for whether it be Black Lives Matter protesters or what he wanted to change to be just protesters or people out there. Who knows what his story really is? But that's the first thing. If they find it was reasonable, then he's allowed to have the gun out. And then the next thing the question, the question is, is was it accidental? Did he jar forward and the gun just went off or not? The problem that I have is he pulled out his gun under circumstances which I personally find to be at a minimum negligent. You're in a car with other people, a gun is pointed in the direction of the other occupants. When there's not an immediate threat of death or great bodily harm, he can spin it how he wants. That's not how I feel it is. 
I don't know, would jurors feel the same way? Hell, I thought O.J. was guilty, and they, they found otherwise, so who knows? Yeah, I, I, the thing that I think is interesting, and I know in just a few minutes we're going to have Charles Middlestat on with us, and he's pointed this out with me in the past, the drinking piece of this. You know, they were drinking, they being Tex and his wife Diane, were drinking quite a bit that night. And so for someone who is well-versed in guns to be handling a loaded gun in the backseat of a car after having had that much to drink, knowing he has a sleep disorder, order. I don't know. If I were the defense, I'd be concerned about that. And if I were the prosecution, I would be pushing hard on the alcohol piece of this during my close. Do you think that yeah. either side is focused on that enough? Uh, <laughs> it's a million dollar question. I don't like to criticize because I don't know. But I, I do believe that both sides are focused at a minimum on negligence. Yeah, you shouldn't have a gun in your hand unless it's an absolute last resort. Tell me that there's someone banging on the window and you see an object in that person's hands that you reasonably fear will be used to harm you or the occupants in your vehicle. I say, okay, pull out the gun. But otherwise, at a minimum, it's negligent. Now, is it reckless? And there is a huge difference. Right. Reckless, a willful and wanton disregard of human life or property. Ah, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know if it gets to that point. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see what the jury does with that. I am dying for the jury to get this case. But when, when they do, one of the counts that they're going to be able to look at is whether or not Tex actually tampered with Danny Joe's testimony. And we're going to throw a clip now to Danny Joe's testimony about that point, about the conversations that she had with Tex MacGyver. Uh, regarding whether or not she was there, her role in that whole event. And then I want to talk to you, Mark, and we'll bring Charles in in just a little bit, talk to you about that w witness tampering charge and where do you think that will go and how you would address it in your closing. But first, let's watch the clip of that particular testimony. Welcome back to the Law and Crime Network. I now have two wonderful guests with me. We still have Mark Aguilarsh, who is here, a uh, well-known trial attorney. Many of you trial viewers know him well. And we also have Charles Middlestadt, who's been with us and so helpful in this Tex MacGyver case. His expertise as a criminal investigator is certainly really insight that we can use as we talk about this really interesting case. Welcome, Charles. Thank you. So I, I want to talk to you both about the testimony we just heard from Danny Joe. You know, she was the key witness because she was there during the alleged um, murder, if you believe the prosecution's case. And she's the only one that there's a remaining count about tampering with the witness. I want to start with you, Charles. What do you think about that count? And do you think that there's anything more the defense could have done to sort of knock that count down the way that they did with the other two? Well, you know, that certainly is the most problematic of the three witness tampering counts. As we know, two of them have already been knocked out. So uh, I think in as part of their case, they brought in these nurses. They, they recalled these nurses that actually had testified during the state's case um, to testify about the fact that they didn't hear Tex say that. There, it had been alluded to, the, to earlier in their case that uh, perhaps they had heard uh, Tex making those sort of utterances that the gun uh, went off accidentally in the uh, in uh, Diane's back, it was behind her, and they denied that during the defense case. So I think they've done probably as good as they can in, in trying to defeat um, that count, but uh, at the end of the day, you still have Danny Joe's testimony. Yeah, and I, I think her testimony was strong, Mark. When you have a situation, Mark, where you've got a witness who you want to use her testimony for some things and sort of support her credibility and say that she's fabulous for some things, but then also you want to cross-examine her hard on other things like this count, how do you handle that? How do you sort of go at a witness and yet not hurt their credibility so much that the jury believes nothing? Right, that's why trial work is an art form. It's not easy. So you say, clearly we know that she was being candid when she said the following. We know that she wasn't candid when she said X, Y, and Z. You just kind of have to do it that way. Yeah, and I, I think the best you can do in those situations is try to use evidence to support the parts that are supposed to be candid and use evidence to sort of knock down the parts that aren't so candid. And here, I don't know, this, this witness tampering charge is going to be interesting. Uh, Tex faces five years for that charge. He's 75 years old. Um, you know, Charles, as you pointed out, he's looking a little frail. Do you think that he will, if he's found guilty of that charge, do you think he'll die in jail? Well, I, I, I have no way of knowing, obviously, but, uh, you know, hopefully not. But 
you know, let's see what happens. I mean, this, I think that, I think the prosecution has thrown so much at this jury. Uh, this case is gone uh, is exceedingly long based upon the evidence that they have. I mean, they, I think they've overtried the case yeah. and perhaps the jury rejects a lot of this because they simply haven't delivered on a, on a significant portion of it. Yeah. And, and you mentioned the overcharging of the case and, and Charles, you've told us before, we've talked about this before here at Law and Crime, that this case was originally charged as an involuntary manslaughter charge. And then they increased the charges and now they're asking for the lesser includes, included charges. Mark, what do you think is going through the prosecution's mind? Do you think they realize at this point that they've overstepped their bounds and they're trying to back up? Or do you think that they're just covering all their bases? I think they knew when they began with jury selection in this case that they had a challenge proving the main charge. And so their thought is, that's the ideal. We would love to get him for the murder because we believe it's murder, but we have some challenges proving that beyond it to the exclusion of every reasonable doubt. But I agree with Charles. I agree with others who say, don't overcharge, don't reach because it can have a negative impact on jurors. Go with what you've got with certainty. And that one would argue is either reckless or negligent conduct coupled with the tampering. And that's what you argue, not reaching for the murder, which you don't necessarily have. Yeah, I, I agree with you both. And I think that the majority of the trial watchers that I've talked to and been interacting with online seem to agree as well. The other interesting part of this case is all of the physical evidence that the jury's had the opportunity to see. We've seen so much, you know, the reenactment of the car that was brought into the courtroom and the people sitting in the car during Danny Joe's testimony. She actually sat in the car. And now we know the jury right now as we speak is out actually getting in the car itself. Charles, do you think that that's helpful in this case? Do you worry that the jurors are looking at it with their own perspectives and their own prisms rather than uh, an expert perspective in this type of thing? You know, I don't necessarily think that it's going to be hurtful to the defense, uh, Heather. Uh, they've, there's already been so much uh, focus placed on uh, the vehicle itself, the measurements, the trajectory, uh, based upon the recreation, both the in-court demonstration and the 3D animation that they have. And, you know, I, I think it's probably going to support uh, the defense's contention in this case, that is that the, um, if you look at the trajectory rod, you look at the entry hole in the back of the seat, it's going to be entirely consistent with being at Tex MacGyver's lap level. So I don't think there's going to be anything that they're going to learn that's going to shed any new light. Now, the one thing that actually may favor the defense is the fact that their 3D animation and their in-court demonstration didn't have doors on it. And so part of the state's argument was that there's the possibility that the gun was actually at his hip uh, facing upward. And the defense has argued that that was an uh, inaccurate uh, illustration based upon the fact that there, was, there were no doors, there were no handles, and that in, there's not enough room to, for that to even happen. So I suspect the jury's really going to look at that possibility, and that they may just conclude that that would not have been possible, and they'll be left with the, with the conclusion that the gun would have had to be resting at lap level on, uh, sideways. It's dangerous, isn't it, Mark, when you bring in a 3D animation that isn't exactly to the T what was actually occurring at the event? Because don't you worry in those situations about losing credibility with the jury? Big time. Yeah, you better look. You don't put uh, an animation based upon what you would love for the evidence to be because a good prosecutor can poke a hole in it and then it looks like you are trying to pull one over on the jury. Put it as close to what the facts support and then if there's a little wiggle room to make the facts the way you want them to appear then great but you cannot deviate too far or you have egg on your face yeah i i i think charles you're the point well taken that the fact that there was no doors given that that is a material issue with how much room text would have had to maneuver i think that that was a mistake even if putting the doors on actually hurts their their 3d animation i think that having that credibility with the jury may be even more important than making sure that they make that point now we know that the jury is looking at the car now they're going to come in and then talk about lunch and then there's two more rebuttal witnesses uh, one of them is the sheriff apparently and another is a financial expert how much Charles do you think this idea of the motive being finances has actually gone anywhere in the prosecution's case do you think they've met their burden in any way there I, I don't I really think that's one of the great shortfalls of their case um, the, I think it it simply has been shown and demonstrated that uh, 
you know, in the context of this relationship, these two individuals really cared for each other. No one's come in here and said that that wasn't the case. No one's talked about any sort of acrimony. This notion that uh, they, they floated this insin insinuation that there was potentially a, uh, an affair with a masseuse, that got shot down. And so really, it's, it's really left to the finances. Uh, we haven't seen any evidence of uh, Tex having some sort of browser history where he's researching, mm -hmm. staging an accidental shooting. We haven't seen any, there's no evidence of, of any sort of infidelity. Uh, I think the prosecution's got caught with, uh, got caught with egg on their face with the boot, the whole boot story. I mean, we have a woman who has a 10 and a half foot and Diane had a, I believe it was a seven a foot, uh, that, that it wouldn't even be physically possible for that to have taken place. Yet it sounds like they're going to call another rebuttal witness who, uh, who is the, the gentleman who actually gave Diane those boots. And so, uh, it, it, by all accounts, Diane was worth more to text alive than, than dead. And um, there's not a single uh, recipient of a life insurance policy whose net worth doesn't go up after the death of a loved one, but they'd all rather have their loved one back. So I, I just don't see that motive. You know, I, I agree with you, Mark, uh, Charles. Mark, what do you think about this idea of the motive? And also, as Charles pointed out, this allegation or inference, really, by the prosecution that there was an affair. Annie Anderson was the masseuse who the prosecution seemed throughout the course of the case to be implying that there was something unusual going on between she and Tex. And then last week when she testified, they acted all insulted that that was not their intent at all. Do you think that they were hoping that the jury would sort of read into that without having to overtly make that allegation and then back it up? Yes. And let me say the following. I don't believe that Charles isn't a lawyer. Not only does he, <laughs> not only does he look like one, but the argument that he just made, I can't top. Exactly how he laid out that they fell short of proving either an affair or any financial motive. Ditto to what he said. I won't waste time repeating it because he did it so well. What I would say is that you know, the prosecution is going to get up there like every damn prosecutor does and says, we don't have to prove motive. Yeah. And they're right. In a murder case, they don't. You don't know why people kill. But in a case like this, where the defense is arguing it was a tragic accident, then there better damn be a motive, guys. You better come up with that. And while they threw out a bunch of stuff out there, nothing really stuck. It's not like the typical motives that jurors have seen on Law & Order that they become accustomed to seeing guy who takes out the insurance policy, who goes from rags to riches. That wasn't the case here. So that doesn't fit. Yeah, and, and Charles is so right. I think that in, in days of law and order and the things that you mentioned, Mark, jurors are looking for that browser history, the text messages, the emails. They know that all of that exists, and they know that in their own lives, anyone who's done anything that they don't want people to know about worries about what their text messages, what their emails show. And not having that here, I think, does hurt. I want to go to a, a commercial break, but when I come back, I want to talk to you gentlemen about the fact that Tex MacGyver himself is an attorney and how that played into his actions immediately following uh, Diane's death and how that's playing into the trial as well. But first, this quick commercial break. Welcome back to the Law and Crime Network. I'm Heather Hansen with two phenomenal guests this afternoon. We have Mark Iglosh, who's been with here with us for a bit, talking about the Tex MacGyver case and his own case with his client, Gabrielle Vega. And we have Charles Middlestat, a criminal investigator who knows the players in this Tex MacGyver case so well. Thanks again for coming on with me this afternoon, gentlemen. My pleasure. Mark, I want to ask you, because I know you have to leave us in just a minute. So before you do, I want to ask you a little bit about having a lawyer as a client. Uh, it, it can't be easy for these defense attorneys to be representing not only a lawyer, but a lawyer who is so well known in the community, so vocal, who is so uh, so much of a control freak, I guess, is, the, is one way that you could put it immediately after the facts and in the months and years following it. What do you do when you're defending a case when you've got a client who really wants to run the show I've represented lawyers in the past and having a lawyer as a client gives jurors two people to dislike <laughs> <laughs> so so I must as I do with all of my clients whether it be a lawyer whether it be anything else I've got to humanize my client I've got to show them to be a decent loving human being they'll realize that about me fairly soon into jury selection but the guy sitting there real quiet, who they're going to talk bad about, I always inject the most positive things about those clients so the jurors 
can look at that person as a human being. And as far as running the show, I make that very clear. Either I'm going to run the show or you are, and there's no offense. My ego is not my amigo. If you want to run it, I'm sure there's another lawyer that would be better suited to let you run the show. I'm the one running the show here because I care exclusively about getting the best outcome for you. Well, I know you need to leave this show in just a minute, Mark. I do want to thank you for coming on with us and especially telling us the story about Gabrielle Vega, your client. Will you please keep us posted on that situation and come back and let us know as things go along? Absolutely, and thank you for having me on about that. Thanks so much, Mark. Have a good afternoon. Thank you. Charles, I want to follow up on that with you and talk to you about... As Mark noted, this idea of running the show. Now, I know you're there in Atlanta. You're right at the epicenter of all these events. Do you think that Tex has been able to effectively step back? And if so, if it, it appears to me that perhaps he has, what do you attribute that to? Well, it certainly does appear that he has. I mean, it, it appears that his attorneys have been able to do their jobs. Um, he has, first of all, he elected not to testify, which I think was um, very, very wise on his part. The uh, his team has done an excellent job throughout this trial and in, in actually um, eliciting what would be his testimony through various state, state's witnesses, so it became really unnecessary for him to sub subject himself to cross-examination. Um, but, it, it, but it seems like, um, you know, he certainly sat back, let them do their jobs. He's he doesn't seem to be involved on any, uh, you know, I've certainly been at a defense table before where defendants are constantly nudging their yeah. defense attorneys, um, make, taking copious notes and are much more engaged. Uh, that doesn't seem to be the case with text. Uh, I know all these attorneys very well, and they're incredibly capable. They're some of the brightest um, in Atlanta. And um, I'm confident that they probably, given that they are the second defense team around, that they had a conversation early on in the retention process where they essentially echoed basically what Mark just did, which is, listen, we'll, we'll, we'll have, we're happy to represent you, but uh, we're going to lead the charge. And uh, naturally, as any defendant enjoys uh, the right to make the ultimate decisions in their case, if you think you're better situated to make those, then we're probably not the team for you. And it seems like he's respected that. Yeah, which is which is difficult. I mean, difficult for someone who's used to being the one making those decisions and really putting your fate in someone else's hand. But as you pointed out, I mean, the attorneys in this case have been a pleasure to watch on both sides of, of the of the bench. You know, both the prosecution and the defense attorneys have done their job well and effectively. And you can tell that they uh, most likely have worked together before. There's a lot of respect they, they there. All have. A, yeah. They all have. I've been in cases with all of them, um, with Clint Rocker, within the entire uh, with everybody involved in this case, including uh, including the judge uh, who used to be a prosecutor, both state and federal. So um, everybody is very familiar to one another in this case for you years can, now. You can see the mutual respect. I mean, you know, you don't have to always like the judge's ruling or what the other side is doing. And I know Friday, uh, the defense attorney got a little heated and they went back and forth or the prosecutor was yelling about something. But in general, despite the fact that emotions do get high during trials, they've all sort of handled this case with the respect that comes with years of having worked together. Given your insight, Charles, I wonder if you know anything about, so this afternoon we're expected to hear, at least according to reports on Friday from Putnam County Sheriff Howard Sills. He's one of the prosecution's rebuttal witnesses. Do you know anything about Sheriff Sills? Do you know his role in this case and what we can expect to hear from him? You know, I really don't, other than my understanding is that um, he and Tex uh, were, are friends. Um, I, I know him as the Sheriff of Putnam County. I've had uh, cases out there. In fact, Vinnie Politan and I have been covering a uh, missing persons case out there. Actually, I'm sorry, it's actually a double homicide uh, out there that's really tragic and unsolved. But So I only know him from that uh, standpoint. I really don't know what sort of testimony he's going to be offering on rebuttal. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see. You know, rebuttal witnesses aren't the norm. It's certainly allowed, and it's certainly, in, in this case, I do think that having the sleep disorder specialist come back in didn't hurt. Um, I don't know how much it helped the prosecution's case, but it'll be interesting to see who who these these two following witnesses are and how much they actually bring to the case. I I want to get your opinion, Charles, on who the the star witness was in this case because when when I started looking at the case before it started, you know, reading all the information on the case, who was expected to testify, I had some thoughts in my head as to who would be the key witnesses, and I think it actually played out that way. But I wonder first from you, who do you think? were the key witnesses and why? 
Well, certainly Danny Joe Carter. Uh, and actually, you know, interestingly, interestingly for both sides, I mean, she delivers certain things for the prosecution in support of their case. But, uh, you know, she also offers a lot to the defense in terms of pursuing um, their theory of the case and supporting a lot of uh, Texas contentions and, and uh, a lot of things that they argued in their opening. So uh, she, to me, she's clearly the most important because she's the only one in the vehicle um, who uh, really, uh, well, that we've heard from. And so at least directly, uh, we've heard indirectly through her about what Tex said and through others, but um, she doesn't seem to have an ax to grind. And um, there are certain aspects, as, we, as you kind of alluded to with Mark, it was a very difficult cross for the defense because there are certain portions of her testimony that they want to embrace. And then there are other portions that they want to distance themselves from without uh, being too adversarial and without calling her a liar. And I think they threaded that needle very well. Yeah, I, I agree with you on that. You know, Danny Jo is one of those witnesses that if, if you're presenting her, you just say, tell the truth. You know, she's that right. some of it's good, some of it's bad. And, and, and it's a great witness to have because you don't have to worry about how to maneuver around the testimony. You just sort of let her tell the truth and then and then try to point out any inconsistencies with the facts without calling her a liar, though, because I think maybe that she didn't remember. Right. Maybe right. her memory's fuzzy. Maybe, you know, it's, she didn't see the entire. That's just her perspective. I mean, there's a lot of ways to handle that. And, and you make such a great point because clearly she's the type of witness that the jury is going to like. She has no reason to lie. She has no reason to not just go out there and tell her truth. And she comes across very credible because she hurts both sides. She's not just supporting right. one side or the other. And so I do think that that type of a witness, the jury is going to like her and want to believe the things she says. And so you have to be careful to say maybe she was mistaken as opposed to maybe she lied about that one thing. I want right. to I want to play another clip of Danny Joe because I agree with you. I think she is the key witness in this case. And then when we come back, Charles, I want to talk to you a little bit more about some other key witnesses that we heard from, and specifically Annie Anderson, who you mentioned a little bit earlier. I want to dive in a little bit deeper to her testimony. But first, let's watch a little bit of Danny Joe. Welcome back to the Law and Crime Network. I'm Heather Hansen here with Charles Middlestad as we continue to go through some of the evidence that the jury has heard in this very long trial uh, in the murder case of Tex MacGyver. Charles, we just saw Danny Joe getting up and doing, I, I, we, I always call it a dog and pony, but you know, she's pointing at the screen, the prosecutor's taking her through the scene and the streets and so forth. How effective do you think that that is? And can it overcome a lack of true evidence to have a lot of dog and pony shows to sort of get the jury involved. We've seen a whole lot of that, Heather, in this case. Uh, you know, it's important for the prosecution to, to put the jury inside of that vehicle for them to understand what the dynamics were, what was going on, um, what were they talking about. But it also, in this case, happens to play uh, in the hands of the defense in that there, there's also mentioned by Danny Joe that there was some political conversation going on. And, and I don't know if you recall, but there was a point in the in Bruce Harvey's cross-examination where he was talking about politics and, it, and everybody for several hours was very uh, curious mm -hmm. as to why he would even inject politics right. in this. And we now know why. And that's because uh, if there was, in fact, some political discussion going on. He would have been a part of it, the inference meaning being that he was asleep. Right. Yeah, it, it was an interesting thing. And I think you and I have actually talked about this because, you know, politics is a very um, volatile subject right now. There's a lot of people who feel very strongly either way. And uh, some of the testimony has sort of perhaps suggested which way Tex would have fallen on that line. But I think you're right. I think it was necessary to say that the fact that he wasn't piping up, and this was right around the election, on something that he was so invested in and so interested in certainly is circumstantial evidence that he was sleeping, which is an important part of the defense's case. Um, I want to, you and I talked a little bit offline, and I want to come back and talk a little bit more about Annie Anderson and her role in this case and her role in that community. But first, we're going to go to a commercial break. When we come back, Charles, I want to talk to you about Andrew, Annie Anderson and whether she, too, was a key witness in this case. Welcome back to the Law and Crime Network. I'm Heather Hansen here with Charles Middlestadt. And Charles, I want to talk to you about the other witness that I was really waiting to hear from throughout the course of this case. And that was Annie Anderson. She was the masseuse for both Diane and Tex MacGyver. And yet 
I felt, and I think you agree, that there was this inference that her relationship with Tex was more than that throughout the course of the case. How do you think that played, and how do you think her testimony played? I think it, I think it fell entirely flat uh, for the prosecution, and, and there was more than an inference, in my opinion. I mean, Clinton Rucker can jump up and down and, and claim that there wasn't, but I think, um, as Don Samuel appropriately stated, that, you know, if they hadn't called her as a witness, probably 12 out of 12 jurors would have believed that there was something going on. So, you know, given the fact that she was so adamant in her denial and also in her characterization of uh, her friendship, both with Tex and Diane, uh, I think that she was a very credible witness. Her husband was in the courtroom. I mean, this is a woman who's, she's a married woman. She's had uh, essentially her reputation dragged um, through inference, through the mud uh, during this trial. And I think she got up there very forcefully and effectively and made strong denials. And I think probably the biggest thing that came out of it was with regard to this whole boot uh, issue is the fact that they're not even close in size. I would have loved to have seen the defense actually have uh, had her try on uh, yeah. those boots. I mean, it would have been a la O.J. Simpson style. You know, if the boot doesn't fit, you must acquit. I, and that would have been super, super powerful. I would have. I was waiting for that. I was hoping for that because I, too, have big feet. And I know that you cannot shove that foot into that. But I've got to be honest, as an attorney, you know, you're afraid to have that moment because what if the juror thinks it's fitting or she's faking it not fitting? I mean, it works so well in the O.J. case, but it is a little bit of one of those things where you're told not to ask a question you don't know the answer to. But man, what if, how effective that would have been had the jury been actually actually visualize her not being able to get her foot into that boot? Yeah, I think it would have been very, very powerful. And it, it would have been, to me, symbolic of some of the other uh, failings in their case and their inability to deliver on certain representations, certain promises made during opening argument. But, you know, I think, Heather, at the end of the day, uh, she ends up being a much more significant witness um, than, than one would think in the jury's mind because, you know, she becomes somewhat central to this, mm -hmm. to the, to the state's theory of their motive, uh, given that all we've heard this entire time for three weeks now is what a great relationship, how loving, uh, these two individuals were towards one another. And in order for the jury to believe the state's, uh, motive, uh, there has to be much more than just money in this. There had to be some sort of acrimony, some sort of affair, something more going on between these two individuals uh, for Tex to have wanted to premeditate her murder. Yeah, it's, you know, they heard so much about her throughout the course of the prosecution's case, and then to hear from her and not support the prosecution's case at all, I think the tone of that is is harmful to the prosecution's case. I want to play a little bit of her testimony specifically with regard to that boot as we as Charles and I just spoke about. And then when we come back, Charles and I will talk a little bit more about Annie and, and her role in the case with regards to the sleep disorder issue. But first, a little bit from Annie and about her boots. And there's Annie Anderson, the witness that we were just talking about. And that's actually the clip where she's talking about her size foot. I mean, the look on her face, Charles, and the level of disgust that she clearly has with this allegation, very effective for a jury to see that, isn't it? I think so. You know, in, in addition to uh, that aspect of the prosecution's claims falling short, you know, she also talks about the sleep issue, right, which is so central to this. Right. Um, and that's one of the more powerful things that comes out of her testimony for the defense is just how quickly Tex would fall asleep on her table. You know, we heard from Dr. Pressman and uh, you know, I think he was a little over the top, a little too anxious to uh, tow the, the prosecution's line. He took some liberties with regard to um, some of the inferences that he drew from Texas testimony in terms of whether it's possible that he could have fallen asleep or not. And, and I think the jury, that's not going to be lost on the jury. I think they're going to rely on good common sense and their own personal experiences. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, the, the speed at which you may fall asleep in, in a car, right? You, uh, I think every member of the jury can relate to the fact that you've, you're on, the, on a trip on the highway and you, you nod off for a split second. You uh, awaken abruptly and just before you're about to run off the side of the road they will be able to relate to those sorts of experiences. Hearing from her as to the speed uh, at which he would fall asleep, I think is significant. Um, uh, hearing about the, really, the, I think the history of 
um, his sleep disorder is more significant than the actual um, science behind it. Just knowing that there's been an issue there, I think, is probably all that the defense needed to do was just to plant that seed. So overall, I think she has been a very, very important witness for the defense on, on numerous levels. Yeah, I mean, you make such a great point, Charles, about common sense. And so many times in my closings, I ask jurors just to rely upon their common sense, because here, as in many cases, you have the battle of the experts. So you have an expert on one side that says that the sleep disorder was not a cause and not a problem, and the other side that says that it was. And so it's important when you have that battle of the expert, a, for the jury to apply their common sense to that battle. But then also here you have not only Annie Anderson, but also medical records that support that this was a pre-existing condition. Whether you believe that that had a huge impact or not, it was there. It was established. It was established by medical records before this event ever happened. And then Annie comes in and supports that. And so then the battle of the experts becomes a little less important, doesn't it? I, I couldn't agree more. Absolutely. I really do think that this jury in particular, we know from the questions, and um, this judge has allowed them to become, you know, very interactive in this case. Yeah. It's very unusual, but he's such a great judge, a very common sense judge, and he really wants this jury to weigh all of the evidence in this case. And, and even when the prosecution has failed and the defense has failed to elicit all the relevant testimony uh, out of certain witnesses, he's giving them a chance yeah to go ahead and ask these questions and satisf satisfy themselves. And you can tell from their questions, Heather, that they are very much engaged, even uh, with Dr. Pressman's testimony, which frankly could be a sleeper. Right, <laughs> no, no, right. yeah. But, but they even had some questions. And so, you know, whether that's two or three of the jurors or they're all equally interested, who knows? But um, the fact of the matter is they are paying attention and they, they seem like they're very reasonable minded. Yeah, and, and to your point, he is really a jury's judge. You know, we've seen this. I remember one of the first cases we had at Law and Crime was the Aaron Hernandez case. And that judge, too, explained everything, was very cognizant of their schedules, was very cognizant of their comfort. And this judge, I've seen a little bit on Twitter where some people are pushing back and saying that he has been favoring the prosecution. But I think he's really been favoring the jury and making sure that they get every single piece of evidence, the opportunity to handle the gun, the opportunity to get in the car, and really just trying to make sure that they have everything they could possibly need to come to a conclusion. Is that your sense as well? It is. It truly is. I've always found him to be pretty even-handed. I mean, certainly, you know, depending upon which way a ruling goes, you're going to take exception to it if it doesn't go your way. But I think overall, uh, I think he's been... Uh, pretty damn fair. And you know, you've made the point, Charles, and it's a point that I've repeated when you haven't been here, that this case really comes down to the difference between two pounds of force and 12 pounds of force with respect to the firing of that gun and whether or not it was an accident or whether it was on purpose. We now know that the jury will soon get the case and in the jury room, they'll have the opportunity to hold that gun. Does that concern you for either side? Do you think that it's a good idea to have jurors who are not, I mean, I've never, I've never held a gun. I don't know that I would know how it's supposed to feel or what it's supposed to do. Does that worry you for either the prosecution or the defense? I think it's actually very favorable to the defense. If you recall the, the, the state's own GBI expert, uh, Weitzel, uh, I mean, accidentally discharged it. He had that oops moment where, uh, where it went off. So it's a, um, you know, that two pounds, I can't emphasize how light that trigger is. And I think by being able to handle and examine the gun, they will see for themselves if, if in fact, they are allowed to, to cock it. Right now, the you know the gun is secured. If they actually unsecure the gun to where the the, the jury can actually um, run through all of the functionality of the gun, meaning both single and double action, and, and get a sense of that for themselves, they will very quickly learn that it does not, with two pounds of pressure, it does not require that you actually have your finger in the trigger guard. You can just brush up against it. Uh, as Bruce Harvey pointed out, a set of keys in a pocket could set it off. Um, just a text rubbing, you know, brushing his hand over the edge of the trigger 
through that plastic bag would have been sufficient to set it off. And I'm confident that they will they will see that for themselves, and that's a that's a good fact for the defense. Yeah, it's it's going to be interesting to see. Now we're waiting right now. The jury has or is in the process of looking at the SUV and actually getting into it if they want to, walking around the SUV if they want to, and then they'll take their lunch break. We know the prosecution has said that they were going to have other rebuttal witnesses this afternoon. What do you think we're going to hear from rebuttal witnesses, if anything? And um, and in just a minute, I want to talk to you about closings. Well, let's see. You know, it seems like the both sides are continuing to reevaluate what they're what they're doing. Who, you know, we'll see if they actually call these rebuttal witnesses or not. Um, they may reevaluate after they observe the jurors in in the uh, vehicle itself, and they may decide that they may just want to just leave it where it stands and and give the case to the jury, uh, and then go into their closing arguments. But uh, so we'll see. You know, I, I just again, I don't know what Sill, Howard Sills, the sheriff, uh, would offer. Um, I just know that they were, they were, and I believe are still friends. Yeah, it's uh, it's going to be interesting to see. This case has definitely been a long one. I know at some, at right around the end of the prosecution's case, the jurors were asking how long is the defense case going to be. It was very short. It was what two and a half days, I think. Do you think that that was um, effective by the, the defense? I mean, obviously they're going to put on all the witnesses and all the evidence that they think is important. But I do get the sense that they were conscious of the jury's uh, feeling as though they had a lot of the evidence they already needed. Do you think that they purposefully tried to be really cognizant of the jury's time on the defense side? I think absolutely. I think by doing so, it contrasts the prosecution's yeah. Uh, insistence on on t on taking so much of this jury's time for evidence, frankly, that either didn't quite materialize. It materialized on on some level, but not to the full extent that they had promised. Uh, or they simply there are dots that they have not been able to connect in this case. And it reminds me of the the Casey Anthony case, where the the prosecution went for for gold in that case. They went for the death penalty, and they pre presented evidence that they could not connect entirely and the jury rejected the case out of hand and penalized him for that and i don't know that it's going to happen to that, to that extent in this case but certainly if the pro if the defense has the opportunity to rebut certain aspects of the prosecution prosecution's case in a much more surgical way like they did um, which being the the financial motive and the the sleep issue and also the uh, the firearms uh, issue they brought in their own crime scene uh, expert, uh, Ross Gardner. Uh, I think they were very hyper-focused on the things that they thought the jury needed to hear the most and that needed the most clarity on, and they left the rest alone, and they they were reassured that they dealt with that evidence the best they could on, on cross-examination during the, the state's case in chief. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, I think that they went one, two, three, countered the evidence the prosecution had, had presented, and then calling Annie Anderson was an important piece. It was almost like a bow on a package, you know, making sure that she countered sort of the tone of the prosecution's case. I want to play another clip of Annie and then I want to sort of end my time with you, Charles, by talking to you about closings, which could happen as early as tomorrow, and um, what you expect from each side with respect to closings. But before we do that, let's watch a little bit more of Annie's testimony, which was one of the most recent witnesses that the jury heard from. Welcome back to the Law and Crime Network. There was a little bit of those heated moments, Charles, that you had referred to earlier, uh, where the defense was trying to sort of give Annie the opportunity, even separate from the lawsuit, to defend her good name in the community. Do you think she was able to do that the way that she had hoped? I think so. And, and actually what you saw there with Don Samuel was someone, uh, something rather uncharacteristic for him. I mean, he was actually somewhat outraged. He was expressing a certain sense of outrage at this insinuation. Um, and that's really not his style. He's usually a pretty even keel um, sort of guy. Um, and so um, it just shows you, and I think it demonstrated to the jury that uh, they wanted to put an end to this nonsense, this uh, insinuation that had been made throughout the throughout the case, and that um, similar to some of the other assertions that have been made, um, this one had absolutely no merit, and they wanted to to just squash it entirely. Now, we're coming up on the end of this case. It's a case that's been long, especially with spring break falling in there, and the jury had a week off of the case. If you're, let's go through each side. If you're on the prosecution side, what points are you going to try to make? Are you going to fall back on the lesser charges? Uh, are you going to go for the moon and hope to land among the stars? How are you going to address your closings? And then I want to hear what you do on the defense side. I think prosecution 
to um, uh, Texas actions, um, the the inconsistent and differing statements that he made. Um, they're going to reemphasize the um, the witness tampering. Uh, assuming there's still one left, that won't count. Um, we're going to uh, emphasize the odd behavior. Uh, the regardless of the the testimony that we've heard from the defense's case from the two estate attorneys dealing with um, the, the that was given to hold the estate sale and also sell the condo. They're going to argue, uh, I think, the contrary to that, that that was just uh, very money driven. And throughout this whole case, it's always been about the money. And it's always been, if you look at his net worth, a tremendous disparity. Uh, he was on the downswing. He was, his, his income had uh, been cut in half. I think they're going to argue all the same things. They, I mean, they've been able to establish some of that to, to some extent throughout their case. It's just, in my opinion, has not uh, overcome reasonable doubt and has not been sufficient motive to, um, to overcome the other evidence that we heard, which was the, the fact that they had a great marriage. And these were two people that loved each other very much. Yeah, I mean, I think that if they've gone this far trying to present this case of murder, I, I agree with you that they'll continue to do so and try to, you know, grab onto any of the jurors who may have been in agreement with the fact that Texas actions after the fact were certainly questionable. Some of his decisions even during the events at issue were certainly questionable and then hope that maybe if they don't read that standard of murder, they'll get the involuntary manslaughter. If you're the defense side, are you focused on defending not only against the murder charge, but also the involuntary manslaughter by both recklessness and negligence and the witness tampering charge in your close? I think you have to be concerned about all three of those. Um, and you, you just can't assume that the that the uh, jury is going to see it the same way that they are likely seeing it, the way that I see it, uh, in which the, the state has simply failed to meet their burden on the murder charge. Um, you have to assume that that's still a possibility. And, and uh, the, the reckless conduct charge, I think they've done the best they can, and that's why they brought in the sleep expert. They've tried to stay away from the, um, from the alcohol issue in this case. Uh, which I think really is probably one of the major contributing factors yeah. to uh, the recklessness here. And so their best defense to, to that was to focus on another causation for him to have fallen asleep and to be awakened abruptly. Um, but it's a, that's a tough hurdle, I think, because I do think throughout this case, the, the prosecution has uh, done a pretty good job in, in uh, making a fairly compelling reckless conduct case against him. And then the witness, the, the final witness tampering count, again, well, there's, uh, I think the judge uh, has still reserved uh, his ruling on that. He may still kick that count out. So we'll just have to see what happens with that one. Yeah, I mean, Charles, I couldn't agree with you more that the alcohol, I think, has gotten short shrift from the prosecution side. I think that if they had focused more on that, they'd have a more clear cut path to the recklessness and involuntary manslaughter felony charge than they've established. I would have focused a whole lot more on the alcohol piece as well. To your point, and you've said it again and again when you and I have spoken, that's an issue when you're handling a gun, having drank as, had as much to drink as they did. No question. I mean, uh, again, uh, and I agree with you, Heather, I, if I was the prosecution, I think I'd be hammering that. And they may still do that uh, in closing argument. Uh, but the, the fact is, we, we know, we don't know Tex MacGyver's blood alcohol level, but we do know Diane MacGyver's, and it was um, elevated. And you can assume that Tex was probably similarly situated, and that's the very reason that Danny Joe was driving. Um, I mean, they did a great job of parading 40 guns in there, establishing the fact that he's um, a very knowledgeable um, gun owner shoots all the time. He has every reason to exercise good gun safety and clearly in this case, in my opinion, failed to do so, uh, especially if alcohol was a factor. Uh, as far as the, the, the reason to arm himself, pull it out in the first place, I, I think that is it's a reasonable argument the defense has made. You don't wait until it's too late. You don't wait until the, the threat is actually there. I've even done that before when I've been in areas where I felt a little unsafe. I've pulled a gun out of a glove box and put it on the seat um, just out of an abundance of caution. And, and then if you don't need it, then you put it back. So uh, I think that's an argument that is reasonable and that the jury will buy. Um, it's just a question of whether they can get past 
Well, again, I think they have good sense. So I think they're probably, even though the prosecution hasn't seized on it, they probably will seize on the alcohol more than the prosecution has, um, has uh, really highlighted that. Charles, you've done such a wonderful job pointing out all the common sense issues in this case, and we really appreciate your help and your insight to this case. We're going to thank you for this afternoon, but I'm sure we'll have you back on to discuss more about this case and others. But thank you so much for your insight on in this case. Thanks, Heather. A pleasure. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're continuing to watch the Tex MacGyver case. Right now, we're going to play for you some clips of Annie Anderson. We started to watch a little bit of her testimony, and we're going to continue to do so while the jury takes their lunch break. We'll be back in just a bit.